my name is Dorothea Rockburn. I'm a painter. I was born and raised in Montreal. I came to America in 1950, uh, where I've been tenaciously making art ever since. <laughs> Well, the meeting with Mandelbrot is kind of a, an isolated question in a surround situation. Um, working on the Sony uh, murals had a lot of difficulties involved because it was in the winter and there was no heat in the building yet. And so not only were we, all of us, we were freezing because I was working with a crew, and we were in a million sweaters. <laughs> uh, but uh, I've never, no matter how many times I've worked on large projects, it's, it's never something I'm entirely comfortable with, simply because I'm not alone. And I think the day that uh, Benoit Mandelbrot was brought to see the murals, I first of all didn't know he was coming and our friend uh, uh, Bill Wilson brought him and I was up on the scaffolding naturally and they stopped me to talk to me and Bill introduced me to uh, Dr. Mandelbrot. And, uh, I was amazed because, of course, I had read everything I could get my hands on, as well as adjacent work. At that point, I was studying complexity theory, um, like night and day. And uh, I was, and I subsequently did a work called Complexity at Light. And I, uh, when I was working with Max Dane at uh, Black Mountain, um, there were, uh, he spent a lot of time on probability theory. So there was a, a, a kind of an interaction, an interlope of knowledges that were coming at me. And um, of course, uh, on my part, it was all leading to my one interest, which is how is the universe wired? what makes things tick, how do they work. And uh, uh, Dr. Mandelbrot was a very, very charming uh, man. And uh, he, he began to ask me questions. And, you know, why this form was the way it was and why this line was going where it was going. and. As I spoke, and we spoke a long time, uh, like over an hour, as we spoke, he said, well, you're on your way to discovering a kind of visual string theory, <laughs> which kind of <laughs> it was a, a charming assumption, but also a surprising one. And, um, I thought about it a lot afterward, and after I began to know more about string theory, and uh, he was right. He was right. It was, it was, I was using equations that would, would lead to that uh, conclusion. But I, I didn't know, I mean, he could see ahead. And when I talked to him about having studied his material on uh, chaos. He also said this charming thing. I mean, he was, he was totally charming and very generous. He said, I always like to see new uses of my work. It was so nice. Well, the classes at Black Mountain were very, very small. I mean, really small. And teachers always begged you to take their classes. I mean, it was the opposite, you know, was the opposite problem that most schools have. And uh, Dane asked me to take his class, and I told him that I was not. I didn't have the background to take it. He, I think, at that point, he may have had five students, 
maybe only four. And they were all, you know, come to Black Mountain just to work with him. And I, you know, I'd had a, a smattering of algebra, a smattering, you know, a smattering of everything, but no real, really in-depth um, knowledge of higher mathematics or even of mathematics. And, and I said, I, I am unprepared to take it. I don't have the prep preparation. And he said, I will very well, I will teach you mathematics for artists, which resulted in the fact that we took a walk every morning. There was a, uh, a waterfall on the property, and we walked to the waterfall and back uh, through all weather, rain, <laughs> everything. And he showed me numbers in nature. He showed me fiber, fiber notch progressions. He showed me probability uh, theory. He just showed it to me. And very, very tentatively, I began to audit the class. And at the end of or maybe at the middle of the second year, I think I began to do things. I began to do homework, and I became more self-assured, I think. And I knew that I, I knew that I was not passing a test, that I was not doing it for credit, that I was never going to be a mathematician, but it was so much more interesting to me than the art classes. I. Uh, I knew a lot about how to paint and draw because I'd been to the Cold of Beaux Arts and the Montreal Museum School, and I'd had a very traditional background. And I, uh, I felt, I felt that in my soul I'm an inventor of some sort. <laughs> I have. I had an older brother and an older sister, and every weekend we went to the Laurentians to ski, and we skied through new snow with torches, holding torches. I mean, there was a, a you know, my brother's friends and so on, and to me, those lines in the snow and the new snow, seen by both moonlight and torchlight, were incredible drawings. Now, I began art school at nine years old, so, you know, I was drawing. And also, I was sick as a child, and so I drew in bed. So I, drawing was already very much a part of me, but the whole aspect of using one's body to make a line in the snow, I didn't know what it meant at the time, because I was a child, but I can see it to this day if I, I think about it. I know what that meant. And I know what the movement of the sway of the butt in relation to those lines and how that worked. And that is, that is physically a part of me and a part of my work. But I don't, I mean, I, I don't distinguish drawing from painting. I always think that painting in a way is a form of drawing and drawing is a form of painting. I uh, never know exactly what is happening and why I work, or what I'm going to do, or I just usually, when I, if I haven't worked for a while, I begin to work, I, I have some idea about what I'm going to do, and by the end of the second day, every idea has been thrown out. and. I'm working from another source that I don't understand. I know that there are things that interest me in art that occur other places. When you're in nature and the wind blows, the leaves vibrate and, and that makes color vibrate. And in science, they talk a lot about vibrations. And when I'm working, I consciously work with an understanding of vibrations. Vibration, very important aspect. 
I don't know why it is, but at least in art, a lot of so-called ideas have to do with one's ego. And in order to get to a deeper source of what art is, you have to pretty much throw your ego out of the room. <laughs> and uh, part of doing that is to be humble before materials and recognize their voice. But also the world around me. At the time when I did the drawing which make, makes itself, which is in my present exhibition, I was responding in part to the inner luminosity of the paper and how to bring that forth through the geometry inherent in the paper. For me, geometry is a magic, mystical field, all geometry, and this exhibition is all a form of geometry. Uh, and I'm never, I, 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 geometry shows up in the most unexpected ways, I think. Uh, somewhere along the line, I, along the line of my work and research, I understood that most things in the universe move on a ship curve. And I started to explore that. Well, one of the uh, pivotal works of art for me has always been Van Gogh's Starry Night. And since it was done in the uh, late 1800s, I wondered why it was that the movement he portrays around the stars is the movement of a ship curve. I thought, did he, was this uh, astron uh, astronomy information that was coming to the fore scientifically at that time? Perhaps, I don't know. But it's interesting that he knew that. And it's, an, you know, I mean, in other words, <laughs> to do a little more further translating, he's making a painter, painting, and he's bringing out both scientific information and the luminosity of the painting through this method. And I was doing that in 1971 when I, or two when I did those drawings that are in the present exhibition. And I did it by describing the edges of the paper from the center describing the center of the pages from the, from the edges and so on, and doing it as in uh, a, a simple way. But I was definitely reading complexity theory at that time and wondering how that, how that could be. Uh, you know, as I read, very often as I read equations, they translate visually to me. I think that's what Mandelbrot's saying, too. <clears throat> he's, he's saying it's all visual. And at that time, when I was working, all information was verbal. Until computers, information, except for, for art itself, was being disseminated in words. After computers, then it began to be visual. And I'm wondering what the really young generation will come up with, because information is now visual. <laughs>